Welcome to the latest Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights podcast. Hello, I'm Matthew Allen, Global Head of Financial Services at Evershed Sutherland. Welcome to the latest in a series of podcasts in which we're exploring the impact of artificial intelligence on the financial services industry. This is a series designed to help you look beyond the headlines and hype cycle and make the most of the enormous opportunity that AI undoubtedly brings, but on an informed basis and in the light of the rapidly evolving legal, regulatory and risk and control frameworks in which your business operates. Today, we're looking at the topic of litigation and regulatory enforcement. And to help us do this, I'm delighted to be joined by my partners, Jen Miles in London and Ron Zadreski in New York. Jen, Ron, uh, welcome. Great to have you with us today. Uh, Jen, let me come to you first, if I may. Um, No one likes to think about the kind of litigation and (laughs) the true enforcement aspects of all of this, but, you know, it is a reality, I guess. So what do you see coming down the track in that space? Thanks, Matthew. So I'd say with it in the UK at the moment, the current focus is really on that advisory compliance risk mitigation piece, rather than us seeing a lot of enforcement actions or ongoing litigation at present. That will come, but that's not where we are at the moment in the UK. So what we're seeing from financial institutions is them Um, looking to the guidance that's recently come out from the FCA and making sure that they are putting in place regulatory frameworks and government procedures which try to protect them from the risk of that regulatory enforcement action or litigation in the future. So one of the recent things that came out was the FCA AI paper and that made it clear that for the regulator This is nothing new in terms of their approach, their technology agnostic, they're very much principles based and outcomes focused. And what they've emphasized is they will be looking to firms to explain to them how they envisage using AI and what processes in terms of systems and governance they have in place, what risks they've identified and how they intend to mitigate them. So what clients are seeing at the moment is very much the regulator reaching out to them, asking for an explanation on those fronts, as opposed to um, threatening any enforcement action or seeing customers bringing litigation. And, And for our clients, what that really means at the moment is they're trying to get to a place where they're both conversant and comfortable with the data and the technology itself. How does that work? What does it do? But combining that with uh, the skill set of understanding the regulatory and ethical implications around, you know, privacy and data requirements, but also sort of consumer duty piece, operational resilience, and are they treating customers fairly? So it's very much bringing that expertise together and putting a framework in place to ensure that as they roll out AI, both internally and externally, that they're protecting themselves from the risk of enforcement actions and future litigation. So this is just to be clear and for the benefit of the audience at large. So this sounds as though it's very much a kind of existing principles based framework within which firms are operating. And, you know, whether that's around governance, and risk and controls, uh, good customer outcomes in the way that you described. Um, as, as opposed to dealing with, um, you know, anything that's specifically new at the moment? Absolutely. So there's no new legislation. The UK government has gone with its five key principles approach. And what the FCA is saying is, well, actually, what we do is very much aligned to that. So, for example, around the key principle of fairness, that fits directly with their treating customers fairly um, and ensuring that their systems are fit for purpose and and aren't subject to um, any consumer detriment. Thanks, Jen. Ron, let's come to you we know how much you like a bit of litigation in the united states what's been going on there uh well unsurprisingly we are seeing uh quite a bit of of litigation uh, around this issue Uh, for the financial services industry uh, most particularly this deals with generative ai uh, also uh, exposure to data privacy and state law claims and then ultimately class actions. The way that the final 
financial services industry most finds itself embroiled uh, in these kinds of litigation in the US is because of the enormous potential that this technology provides to this particular industry, uh, whether it's in claim processing, marketing, actuarial actuarial uses, the ability to manage enormous amount of data in a consistent basis just provides uh, advantages uh, to an organization that are, are challenging to resist. Uh, but the road has been a bit bumpy. Uh, in certain instances, it really doesn't have to do with AI per se. What do I mean by that? Uh, there is a case that's currently pending in Minnesota, a non-obvious jurisdiction uh, involving United Healthcare, where they in turn purchased an AI product that was alleged to be able to evaluate claims. Um, the plaintiffs in that case uh, have alleged that the tool simply didn't work properly. Uh, so this is an instance where if it was a machine, it was supposed to measure out a one foot piece of wood. And in certain instances, it's only 11 and a half inches. That's what underlies it. It just happens to involve a bit of AI programming. Uh, that's a fair amount of the litigation that we're, we're uh, seeing. We're also seeing instances where uh, data is being used in a way that under various state laws, uh, the necessary consents that is alleged uh, haven't been obtained. Um, finally, uh, again, in the US, unlike the UK and other jurisdictions, one always has to remember they're working under multiple environments. And by that, we have federal laws, we have state laws, and sometimes we even have municipal laws, which can all affect the, the use of a product, an AI product. Um, in, interestingly, uh, to the extent that I'm aware of such studies, uh, while many are concerned about the use of, of AI, it's kind of a, 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 you know, a Dracula or Frankenstein monster that is being created. Uh, in actuality, all studies that I'm aware of show that even the non-functioning AI in most instances performs better than humans at the same function. The difference is that when an AI product makes a mistake, it's gonna make a mistake over the universe of individuals or companies that the product is being applied to, as opposed to, for example, an individual claim handler who might misevaluate claims, but they're only gonna handle a very finite number of claims in the universe. Uh, the jury, metaphorically speaking, is still out on uh, on these on these pieces of litigation, but they provide enormous potential risk uh, if you get embroiled in such a suit. Because in many instances, not all, they involve uh, class action allegations, which multiply the potential damages and risk. And some of these uh, potential classes are very, very large, even by American class action standards. Thanks, Ron. Uh, and Jen, just bringing it back to you, obviously there's a lot of hype at the moment around AI and undoubtedly it, it will continue to have significant use cases and, and, and ones which are yet to be thought through uh, as Ron sort of alluding to. Um, as this all settles down, it becomes sort of structurally part of the financial services industry in a much more significant way. Where do you see, because undoubtedly there will be issues arising, where, where do you see the, the hotspots or, or the things that uh, the clients might need to be focused on? Yeah, so I think clients will be looking across the pond to see where, where the litigation is coming from in the US because... The US is normally ahead of us in that regard. I think for regulatory enforcement actions, you'll see it along the principles we already see. So, you know, did the firm 
um, conduct its business with due skill, care and diligence and take reasonable care to organise and control the affairs responsibly, effectively and adequate management systems around that. It will just be in the context of an AI product. I think for the litigation piece, we're going to see something around data protection. Article 22 of the UK GDPR prohibits certain types of automated decision making. A recent Court of Justice of the European Union case considered the right not to be subject to an automated decision. Although this was a European case, the wording of Article 22 of the UK GDPR is very similar to that of Germany, where the claim originated from. The case related to whether a credit reference agency, SCUFA, was caught by the GDPR. The claimant was denied a loan based on a credit reference score provided by SCUFA to the bank. The European Court was asked to consider whether the credit score provided by SCUFA was an automated decision under Article 22 of the GDPR on the basis that it was then produced to a third party which was relying on it in order to decide whether to make the loan to the claimant. The court considered the matter and held that it was the case that the credit scoring system was to be treated as an automated decision under Article 22. Therefore, whilst a bank would usually be able to rely on the exception that it is using an automated decision process uh, and the data is part of that in order to determine whether to enter into a contract with an individual, this wasn't the case for the credit reference agency, which was providing the score only to the bank. The use of advisory scoring by a third party therefore requires careful consideration going forward, including whether as a bank or a financial institution, you are able to rely on the exemptions and you have the necessary consents in place. It will be interesting to see how this area of law develops as we expect it to be increasingly common that automated decisions are used and that third parties who can provide that AI and the algorithms um, which produce such things like credit reference scores become more common. And Ron, some final thoughts from you in terms of potential future hotspots issues to focus on? Uh, two things. One, uh, particularly for the data privacy concerns that Jennifer just mentioned in the US, the panacea uh, antidote to those is consent. Uh, consumers can always consent. So I would suggest to our listeners, if they haven't already, to take a look at the consent that's provided by individuals who interface uh, with your organization. Uh, do a tune-up to obtain con the consent necessary that AI products can be used on the underlying data consistent with the regulatory environment in which you work. Uh, and uh, secondly, just a little plug, uh, here in the US, uh, we do follow noteworthy litigation litigation involving artificial intelligence. Uh, these are cases that are important for one reason or another. We don't follow every case, so we're not going to inundate your inbox with uh, newsletters or alerts. But if you would like one, please feel free to contact me or any of the individuals uh, on this podcast, and we'd be happy to include you on our mailing list. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Jen. Um... Really interesting conversation and um, lots of interesting perspectives there and food for thought. Thanks to you, the listeners, for joining us as always. If you'd like any further information on the opportunities AI can bring to you or your business or the litigation enforcement issues which arise, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Jen, Ron, myself or your usual Evershed Sutherland contact. This actually now concludes this podcast series on AI in financial services, which has been running for the last couple of months. We hope you found it helpful, informative and thought provoking. We always warmly welcome your feedback and look forward to hearing from you with any suggestions as to how we can enhance and improve our thought leadership in the future, both as to the content uh, and the format and the channels through which we share it with you. Thanks again for joining us and look forward to speaking to you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights Podcast. 